Okay, top of the hour. Part three, archeological applications. Now, we'll go from the top, right, from the biggest down to the smallest, right? Imaging, you know, entire areas versus image. So, let's go with large area imaging, satellite versus drone work. And I will do some, uh, let's do some work here with this. And then we'll do mapping for digital elevation, LIDAR versus photogrammetry, buildings, doing 3D point clouds, sites, which is kind of your best option by far, imaging sites, interiors, only viable with drones made for the task. And there's a couple of really, really sweet uh, products available commercially uh, for doing interior work. And then features and can be done. So the things, you don't need a drone, like think about it, like, okay, you can use land-based cameras and, and iPhones. Now that iPhones have little LiDAR units on them, you can actually do a lot of feature mapping yourself with technology that's literally in your pocket, spying on you every minute of your life. So large area imaging. There are tons of free satellite data out there. There's paid satellite data and there's UAS data, right? Unmanned aerial system data. So let's think about these three things. So the United States is being mapped every 24 hours by companies, right? By companies like Planet. Planet uh, Satellite, uh, there's Sentinel Satellite System. There's tons of free data out there. So planet.com. Every single day at around 10 o'clock local time, an image of the Earth is being captured everywhere, right? You see that little, you can't see the animation, but there's a little satellite system imaging the entire planet every single day, every single day. And you can um, <clears throat> hire them as a service to map an area of the earth for you once or on a continual basis. So uh, you can get about 0.6 meter, about 60 centimeter capacity with that. Uh, they also have historic data. They have made snapshots of the Earth every day and on a quarter, monthly and a quarterly basis that you can also purchase their historic data. This is really good data if you don't need high resolution. Like if you're thinking big, you know, like what did this uh, area look like before the fire hit? And now what did it look like two days after the fire hit? You know, you can do that kind of work with these kinds of uh, systems. For us, you know, like I, I think, you know, there's lots of historic ortho imagery out there. There's all of the, there's, you know, there's basically plates and photographic plates that are being scanned or could be scanned that are sitting in your university repositories. New Mexico has a GIS uh, department and they have taken up all the, all the data that was gonna be thrown out by a lot of national agencies and they've collected it, they store it and you can get access to that. So. You know, there's the Wayback Machine for lots of stuff. There's aerial imagery going back to the 20s in lots of parts of the, the country in selected areas. That's very, very relevant for historic archaeology, obviously. Um, you know, you can use this for all kinds of purposes. So you can get paid data. You can use Google, which is a snapshot that tells you typically when that snapshot is. Um, they've stopped their service of, of delivering data. Uh, by, by right now, um, you can get data that's associated with with uh, systems. So, like, let's go to, to New Mexico, for instance. New Mexico, here's our server. Most states have this in some form or another. So, let's say you wanted to look at, um, you know, ortho imagery. So, let's see, imagery right here. What imagery is available to me in New Mexico for historic aerial photography? from 1934, what do I got? And then you can show it as a map. It'll show you historic data, right? You can say, oh yeah. And then you can either get some of this stuff online or you can go and uh, have request to have it scanned and downloaded in georeference for you for a price. But the data is there. Most states know about this stuff. A lot of the stuff that you know we archeologists since we don't have a lot of money and we don't have a lot of crew, 
to do a lot of this stuff. Some of us don't have GIS departments. We have to do this ourselves. Knowing where all this stuff is and this, this ton of data that's out there and available is actually really uh, nice to know. The United States Department of the Interior has uh, a mapping system called the uh, program to basically photograph the country on a, uh, on a cycle, right? So it cycles through and it, and it photographs the country NAEP. Um, you get four band imagery, typically about half a meter resolution, which is actually pretty good. Um, there's all this free data you can get and that's pretty good. So for most of the time, that's background imagery is good enough. But then sometimes you want other data. You want more recent data. You want recent, you want data right now, right? And then you can do that, right, using the, uh, using drones. So let's go to this. Uh, no, let's not do it that way. Cancel, let's get, let's get to this. Let's get to this my way. Here's the Karst program. Um, slowly but surely, we have been trying to uh, photograph the entire uh, Southeast New Mexico for our clients. Joseph Drive, this is the pro bono work. I can show that. Yeah, here we go. So large area coverage. This is about a mile by half a mile here. And you can see that we have, um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's good. So there's about a section and a half of space that we have mapped with a drone to use as, as a, this is uh, interesting because there, obviously there are archeological sites in this landscape, which I'm not showing, uh, but there's also geological landscape that's really neat. You know, there's lots of karst features, there's caves, there's all kinds of cool stuff. So we did a little, uh, we did a little study with a, uh, with a geologist, a geophysicist, and they had the caves they knew about. And then there was the caves and the features that we could find using the UAV system. And we found more of those little small uh, cars features, those small little caves than the people doing a uh, pedestrian survey could find. So, this was easy because we could do an elevation analysis, but what if we're looking for features on a large scale, right? Um, I'm not gonna talk about Matt Bandy's work, but Matt Bandy just did a reanalysis of, of, uh, of road systems in Northwest New Mexico. And he'll be presenting that I believe in some forum. And he also uh, looked at the LIDAR data and reanalyzed the LIDAR data for finding uh, ring middens in Southeast New Mexico. And he'll be presenting that as a talk at the SAAs coming up. So you can look up Matt Bandy and you can see how SWCA did a reanalysis of all that LIDAR data that they collected for the ring midden project in, in Southeast New Mexico and show you know, a different take on, uh, on analysis. So that was actually pretty cool. So we can do large scale analysis of the landscape using a lot of these, uh, these data systems, these free data. And if we go back to QGIS, I'll just show you. Um, this is, uh, this is how many, how big is this? Oh yeah, this is 1500 square miles of Arizona that had been uh, a digital elevation map was made uh, from photogrammetry from the NAEP data set. And we transformed it, translated it into systems. So you can actually get a very, very, very detailed uh, digital elevation model for Arizona. And if you go on to the free data sources for Arizona, you'll see that there is no three depth data. There's no light free LIDAR data, but we are able to do this um, we were able to do this uh, using, you know, another system. So we we're feeling pretty good about the ability. And if you were interested in things like deviations, you could then analyze this data and see it in action. So this is actually kind of neat. Uh, I'll turn off the, um, the hill shade, which just shows the basically the elevation. And here's the LIDAR model. Here's the, the LR and the local relief model. You can see that a long linear project shows up as an anomaly in the data. And this is caused by the perturbation of the poles 
in the system, this is actually, these are large electrical distribution lines. You can see it shows up in the data. Now that might be a road. You can see roads, you can see all kinds of fun stuff in this data. So at kind of like the landscape level, there's ways of using this data from free sources and you don't need to fly this. It would have taken a year to fly this with a drone, but using ortho imagery from aerial and satellites and then doing our own analysis, we could come up with what we think is a really neat uh, system, right? 1,500 square miles. And of course it's available for all of Arizona, this data set. Okay, so that's large scale imaging. Paid satellite data, Sentinel, many others. If you're interested in satellite data, you already know a lot of this stuff, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but it's out there, it's really neat. And depending upon the period of time, you can go back, you know, you can go back far. Uh, free LIDAR data is, is available from open topography. And you can see that, right? You can see that if we go back to the home page here and we go to data, find data map, that a lot of the United States has been mapped. All the green are available data sources. And if you know how to use and analyze LIDAR data, um, you know, this is actually kind of a neat background. I've used LIDAR, free LIDAR data to help correct ortho imagery and digital elevation models produced with drones. So that's one of the reasons why you want to know about this stuff. What are the accuracy models so you can then snap your model to will be a, a known convention, right? To a known geode, to a known projection system, right? To a known elevation standard. So you can have your data seamlessly integrate with other people's data. So that's really important to know about this stuff. For the built environment, um, I suggest for the built environment that you use a, uh, you can use a Phantom 4, you can use all kinds of drones, but I typically for small scale work, I like to use the RTK drone because I know that relative to my base station, I'm within a couple of centimeters. And that really, really helps with mapping. So here is the uh, Rio Grande Nature Center. This is the vis visitor center. This is uh, done in PIX4D. We were asked by the city of Albuquerque uh, to, do a, uh, to do a quick mapping mission to show them their resources. And part of that was the, uh, this is the regional center, or this is the nature center. And as you can see, you know, you can see the top of the, someone left some cable on the roof, right? Here's probably a data cable coming in, right? Right across the roof here. You can see their HVAC systems. You can see, you know, if you want to do a roof inspection, that is one of the big areas that people use drones for now is to do roof inspections. But you can also do this. Let's switch to 3D view. And oh yeah, look at that. There is your there is your nature center in a point cloud. And that point cloud, you can start taking measurements and you can start, you know, looking at it, you know, looking at these 3D structures. This is for you, Ron, right? We can, this is stuff you can do. All right, you can make 3D point clouds, you can do imaging, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. But here's the problem. No one has developed a system yet to take point clouds and automatically produce DXF CAD files out of them yet. You can actually take point clouds, you can put them into SketchUp, you can put them into other systems, but you still have to do manual work to produce those relative drawings. But you can document the thing really well and you can produce point clouds really well. And if we look at this, this point cloud is good enough to where you can actually, you know, go underneath things, right? You can go through things. You know, so you can say, oh yeah, look at that. It actually mapped it pretty well in 3D. And this is just from ortho imagery. I didn't even try, I didn't even do a crisscross pattern on this. So with a crisscross pattern, I would have even better resolution of the side and underneath some of these objects. So yeah, I would have gotten the side of this a lot better if I would have done a uh, crisscross pattern. This is just for ortho imagery, but you can still see we've got good resolution on a lot of these details. Here's a little viewing wall, you know, where, you know, you can peep on the turtles and, you know, the wildlife that's in this pond over here. So you can, you know, do things like this. And then uh, let's go to another one for the built environment. Here is El Zocalo in Bernalillo. 
this is a historic building. Right? This was done six ways from Sunday, um, taking ortho, taking uh, crisscross, uh, multiple angle patterns. And as you can see, we have a really good rendering of this building in the point cloud. It couldn't get everything, right? Some of the things that are in shadow are not there, but you can definitely make out the entire thing. And as you can see here, it's like, oh yeah, that's not square. That is definitely not square. It's got, you know, interesting angles. You can basically, you know, this is a good way of photo recording, you know, a resource. And if I put the 3D texture mesh on it, it'll kind of fill in the holes between the points and show you the texture. All right, so it'll, it'll take a while to upload this. Now this technology, this is literally the cutting edge technology that we could do. Uh, the reason why Hollywood movies that do 3D reconstructions of space, you know, cost so much money is because you, you've scanned the environment that you're gonna be uh, rendering. And then you have a, literally an army of people, you know, those in the, the credits of a movie where it shows all those people doing digital work, they're then taking this data and then they would produce a renderable model that you can then put superheroes in or whatever, right? So this is, you know, there's a, there's the ways that we do it now, right? This is, this is El Zocalo, right? Fairly well represented. And if we wanted to take this to the next level, we would spend, you know, 10,000 person hours making a CAD model out of this, but it would all be true because you have all the points. You have all the points there so you can then go to the next level. So for historic archaeology and for doing documentation, I think it does a minimal job, but it doesn't go to the next level, which is then doing, um, you know, all the other types of drawings and things you would need to then submit it. Like, let's say you wanted to submit it for a, a registry, national register, you would need to do more of it. But the drone work at least puts it into a context that I think is, is adequate for the job. Yeah, there you go, right there. And it's done at a scale that you're not gonna get with other aerial imagery. All right, let's keep going, here we go. Now, this is in the uh, Angeles National uh, Forest uh, Stream Restoration Project. This is in, um, let's see, where was this? This is the Angeles Forest in California. This is part of a historical system as part of the San Francisco Dam. And if you, if you guys are uh, big fans of uh, national disasters, uh, you'll know that the San Francisco Dam break killed hundreds of people. And it's part of a larger historic context of develop, developing aqueducts and energy to basically feed the city of Los Angeles. So within this, there are roads, there are streams, there are sensitive species. There's, uh, there's basically everything that, you know, you could tick off on a NEPA analysis. Everything is there. And it's California, so it's double. So we were asked um, to do some UAV work and integrate this UAV work with some traditional mapping and land surveys to save on time and labor costs. I'm doing this as part of it because I don't, I, I just feel a little, I feel a, a bit, um, I just want to be careful about showing uh, Native American um, uh, archaeological sites. So I'll, I'll use this historic context site as my example for archaeology. So the benefits of the UAV, we are able to capture a lot of data very quickly and accurately. We were able to map areas that would be considered outside of the bounds of normal safe field work. Like, I want to map this, this historic spillway, which is associated with, the, um, with the, the, the channelization of the stream and moving water into a power plant. And then using that, uh, that energy from the wall back out into the stream. Uh, we were able to cover a lot of ground with very few staff. And when I mean few staff, I mean me. Um, safely conducted the survey in hard to reach areas and then create data products that could be used by engineering and planning. 
like, so if we look at the spillway, this is the point cloud of the spillway. As you can see, it's being undercut. Someone to walk on this thing on the edge because that concrete could break and you could seriously get hurt. Um, it's just a lot of area to do, All right? So let's get into the story. I just used basically a Phantom 4, uh, Phantom 4 copter. Use Pix4D Capture on the Android to plan the missions. There are seven flights. They are about 200 feet above the ground. I got 0.6 inch resolution and ground sampling. Each flight was about 16 minutes. Took about 2,000 photos and was able to map about 74 acres in this first round of mapping. So those are good statistics, right? So think about that. That's about a nice, you know, it's a nice day of work. But in that nice one day of work, I was able to map a nice, a large area, 74 acres. This was a very hazardous situation. You had high power lines. You had um, you had uh, very, very steep changes in elevation. You had trees, you had a road, you had people, you had wildlife. You know, you're in California. If you screw up, you could burn the whole place down, you know, and, and be infamous for starting a fire that burned down half the, you know, the hillside and, and uh, you know, like, yeah, just don't want to do any of that stuff, right? So it was a very, very tough mission. And uh, I was very careful about what I was doing at all times. It was very hot. And with these, these uh, high tension power lines, you could hear the electric sizzle coming off of them. You could hear that sizzle. And I'm sure that everybody here um, has heard that sizzle when you've been working around, you know, 345 KV lines in the middle of the, the summer, you know? And that's not only, I mean, that's air and that's RF interference. So from PIX4D, oh, yeah, will uh, OHE transmission lines interfere with 2.4 gig frequencies? How do you avoid flying into power lines in your project area? That is a big problem. I have lost two drones to uh, some type of weirdness, either a magnetic field, an RF field, something interfering with the drone, and it basically sends it on its way. I, the only way that you can really uh, be safe around these things is to maintain a large buffer power lines and have your RF sensor making sure that you're not getting stomped on in your frequencies that you're broadcasting in. And then it's just up to, it's just up to safety, you know, just basically to recover a drone that might hit a power line and put out a fire, uh, know that you might lose a drone. So you know, always have two backup drones with you in the truck when you're, when you're working. Um, you know, it's just, it's really, let me just tell you, I was really, really um, uh, cautious and not afraid, but, you know, on the, uh, on, ready to pull the mission at any time, considering what might happen. So remember, you know, like there is no honor in, in going past the point of safety when we're doing this work. So if you feel like it's unsafe, that's probably unsafe. Call a safety timeout, stop the mission, reevaluate and see what you need to do to make it safe again. So this is what we are able to do. Ortho mosaics, a point cloud, a digital elevation model, 3D preview of the data, combine all those layers in QJS for visualization, create desktop review layers, and then give those shape, uh, shape files and layers over to people for planning. So the historic dam site, they built a dam in basically uh, on inappropriate rock. And the first geologist who um, surveyed where they wanted to put this dam site said, you are crazy. And um, what's his name? Uh, Ma Holland, Ma Holland decided, I don't like that geologist. I'm going to get another one who will tell me the answer I want. So remember, you know, in consulting, you can always buy the person who will tell you what you want to hear. So they built the dam. It was operational for a while, and then it catastrophically broke and flooded and, and flooded out people's houses and farmland and killed people. It was a disaster. So this historic dam site, uh, a lot of it was cleaned up, but a lot of the debris and rubble is still there. So if we look at this, 
this uh, you can see the the pixels. This is uh, graffiti. This is a there's a little swimming hole right here, where people like to go and take a dip. Um, it's really it's a beautiful location. It's in the shade. It's got nice clean deep water. And people you know are people. They do petroglyphs. Um, this area right here, right? This area right here. This is a part of the dam that was still standing that didn't break, and then it fell over. And this is the rubble from literally the rubble piles from the remaining part of the dam. And you can see, um, you know, like this would be really, really hard to map in conventional ways. You know, like this is all loose concrete and scree. It would just be super dangerous. You'd be on your butt half the time trying to map this. And then, you know, like where are you going to set up all your stations to map this conventionally? Just, yeah. So drones were the way to map this for the client. So from that point cloud, we created a digital surface model. The surface model is not the terrain. This is what the drone saw, all right? This is what the drone saw. And then you can start to remove some vegetation. And this is the terrain model, which is taking all that junk out and showing you the low spots and the high spots. And then from that digital terrain model, here are the contours, showing you know, basically the contouring of, of the slopes, and then with that digital terrain model in PIX4D, you can then do elevation profiles. So you can see, you know, this dot right here corresponds to this. You can see it's high slope down, a nice flat road. Here's a, this is a, a fence, you know, shows a little berm, another slope down, another berm, you know, the, uh, the walkway, and then going up and over the, uh, what was called the tomb. Here's the surface of that little pond, their vegetation, another slope up. Um, really, you know, this is hard stuff to do. And you can do this with photogrammetry, producing digital elevation models from millions and millions of points. And the PowerPoint site, you know, this is, this is really, really steep and difficult terrain. The, here, the power station is over here. There's a, here's the road. Right, going up over the mountains into the valley. And then, you know, here's the, here's the channel and here's the, uh, the concrete spillway. This would have been days and days and days of mapping. We had another team out there mapping and they, it took them a day to do just this area and take about 30 points because there's all this vegetation and the slope and everything. It was just really, really bad. And then here's, you know, the, here's a, there's a bridge. There's another, this is the old road that's no longer active. Here's the stream, right? You can do all kinds of cool stuff. You can just see that this would have been a lot of work to map this. The point cloud of the spillway, as we saw before. Here's the digital elevation model of that spillway. You can see it's fairly accurate. You know, you can see that, yeah, how are we gonna map this? If you're doing it by hand, you know, like, well, a handheld LIDAR unit could do that, but I don't know about doing, you know, work in this, you know, like it could probably be safe to walk in here, but once you get out to this point, mm -mm, that is a no walk zone. I would put a two to three meter buffer around that edge because you don't know if it's going to collapse and drop you down. You don't know if there's void spaces under here either. Just, you know, not good stuff. So, you know, doing handheld LIDAR would take a long time to, to map this, but you could do it. And then of course, you know, what about going this way? Let's see what the drop looks like right there. And then of course, let's view with this 3D model, you can then do, right, you can then do animation. So just flying through the 3D model, you know, flying through the, through the channel, right there under the bridge, then up through, right, up through the, uh, the, the creek, and then back to the truck. Yeah, so this is the kind of stuff that really, really helps visualize projects. We could do this with the 3D mesh. I did it with a 3D point cloud because I just wanted to show what the capabilities are with that. So using drones, I think we did, you know, in one day, basically one day of labor by me, 
I was able to do what would have taken probably weeks to do with a conventional team and in ways that were safer and easier to do. Now, is this, no. Did I see underneath the vegetation? No. Does LIDAR see through vegetation? Yes and no. LIDAR can get returns through vegetation and it can give you some, some data, but it's not going to be the still have a lot of interpolation in LIDAR data. So could you have flown this with LIDAR and got a lot of good data with this? Absolutely. But what's the difference between having a helicopter LIDAR unit fly this and then do all the processing and then give you a point cloud and that between me flying for one day with a drone getting what will then be presentable and actionable data? That's the difference. And you just got to remember, you know, like, what's my purpose? What do I need? What's my budget? You know, how can I do this in the best way possible? Now, I have one final thing I want to do. here. I've got tons of examples from, uh, from work that I can show. And in fact, I'll go back to PIX4D. I will show what will be publicly available information, not site outlines and, and artifacts, but let me just show uh, um, some other work here. Let's see, let's go back to home. Let's go back to, let's go to some projects. I don't want to show anything that's, that's going to be proprietary. Um, the Chosa Draw Parks Ranch Cave. Yeah, here we go. Here's the, here's the arch. This was a really, really neat, a really neat system. Now think about this, okay, I'm not showing you archaeological sites, but use your imagination to start thinking, okay, let's say I have archaeological features that are sitting on the edge of, let's say, a cave. Or let's say that I have uh, some, uh, some habitations that are in the side of a cliff, and I want to map those things. You can go do that and disturb it and climb up there and knock stuff around and do all kinds of stuff, or you can fly your drone and do this, all right? Here's the point cloud. This is a canyon, a nice steep channel where you had a cave system collapse and that collapse, right? Then goes into a deeper portion of the cave. This cave, right? You can see there's the, there's the aperture for the cave. You can go in there and you can shimmy through this thing and then come out a mile away through this car system that has worked its way through the, uh, the rock. It is really, really neat. Um, so there's the point cloud. This was, because I did a 3D point render, think about that, it's like, oh yeah, with this 3D point you know, system flying in an angle, flying crisscross, it's pretty low, so you get a really nice dense data set. You can see individual branches on trees, you can see leaves, and you can even do this. You can even start to map through the system, right? So you can basically, you know, walk through the system. And there I am on the outside of it, right? You can literally map through that. So start not an archaeological site. This is a geological site, so I feel confident that I'm not divulging any uh, proprietary or things that we need to keep secret from the public. This is on BLM land. This is, you know, free for you to go visit if you like. But that's, think about the possibilities for that. That's, that's what I'm talking about. What if you have an earthen work, right? You want to map, which, you know, we've done this forever, right? You know, we've had teams go out there and map earthen works, you know, traditionally, but now let's do the entire district. You know, let's do all of it. You have a site, you know, you have, you have petroglyphs on a boulder, let's say and you wanna be able to map that boulder with the petroglyphs in 3D and produce a model that you can then rotate. Uh, Megan Trowbridge and I did that for a project for the BLM in a location in New Mexico. And we produced some really, really interesting results. So instead of seeing the rock art in 1D, 2D, right, 2D, a flat surface, we now have it in 3D. The rock art people in New Mexico, they've been doing this for a while. They know what they're doing. They're using drones. They're doing this stuff. But it's just that possibility, just using the cameras on our little Toshiba laptops uh, or, or uh, Toshiba pads, 
just taking hundreds and hundreds of photos of everything and then putting them through Pix4D to produce a 3D rendering. Let's say, let's say there were petroglyphs on the inside of this canyon. Well, you would be able to see them and you'd see them in a context. You could get a better idea of doing it. Could you do this with other techniques? Yes. Could you do this with a handheld LiDAR unit? Yes. How much does the handheld LiDAR unit cost? 10 to $20,000 minimum, or you have to rent it and you have to have specialized training. Could you get your part 107 license, get a drone and start flying these missions and taking these photographs and then use PIX4D to put it all together? Absolutely, absolutely. And because you're doing, you know, you're producing a point cloud from photographs, you know, you're, you're basically, you're being as non-invasive as you can be. All right, so I think that, uh, I think that's, that's super important to think about. So let's say, okay, it is 1135. We still have 55 people holding on. I am really impressed by that. So I, um, I'm actually getting tired of hearing the sound of my own voice. <laughs> oh, I want to do this one more thing. Interiors. For those of you in the historic mindset and you have historic resources and the built environment, okay, um, you want to be able to map the interior of spaces. You can do that with handheld LIDAR. You can do that with traditional getting on scaffolds and doing things. But what about places where you don't feel safe because at any moment a panel could drop from the ceiling and hit you. And you have obviously, you have obvious safety uh, concerns, but you still need to get data. Well, there are internal, in, internal drones that do not work off of GPS. There are systems like this. The, uh, the indoor drone for confined, confined space and indoor inspection. I talked to the guys at Elios the other day, and when you're flying a drone, your enemy. But this design team embraced the idea that my drone is going to hit stuff, and I want to make it capable of hitting stuff and not damaging the drone. So they have put a drone in a bubble. And this thing can fly in interiors and do some really amazing work. Like, let's 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 fly in a sewer. I don't want to send a dude in there because this is full of ugh, right? Ugh. But I can fly my drone in there. Um, it produces a 3D point cloud on the fly. It has its own lighting system. It can reveal textures and surfaces, and yeah it will allow you to do some rough and dirty measurements. So like, let's say you want it to map underneath in a place where you don't want to send a person because there's issues with safety and other hazards. There might be hazardous atmospheres. There might be other things. This is the drone that we're looking for to do that kind of interior work. I want to go up 50 feet and look at something in detail, but I don't want to build a scaffold or get a cherry picker and, you know, because I can't move the stuff in there, I can get a drone like this and I can do that work. And I can take all the images I want and I can then do photogrammetry and I can build up point clouds and do all that other work with it. So this is the kind of stuff I think that folks in the historic realm have been waiting for. It took a while for the industry to catch up, but these are not cheap systems. This system, a system for the, Evo, the LEOS 2 system starts at about $50,000. So you would probably want to hire a company that owns one of these and then have them do the mission. So like, let's say you wanted to inspect caves, but you don't, you know, you don't, you don't know about the safety of the cave or the mine or some other thing, right? You'd get one of these drones and you would do the reconnaissance, your initial safety reconnaissance this way before you start sending in humans. And you'd know what all your dangers are. You'd be able to develop a safety plan. You'd be able to collect data uh, initially. You know, you'd know if there was an ESA, uh, you know, protect or, you know, just all kinds of stuff. You know, this is the kind of stuff we want to do. Because, you know, a drone, $50,000, if you lose a drone, that's so much less money than the guilt and the, the, the problems that would happen if you had a human 
uh, have an accident in a confined space. This is just one flyability is the, the company. They have all kinds of cool applications. They have software that goes with it. Inspector 3, super neat. So it builds up and visualizes point clouds on the fly. All right, so you can, in, in, in conjunction with their, um, with their hardware. So, visual inspections are most so uh, with their hardware, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. They're talking about visual inspections for, obviously this is, um, uh, power generation, but you can do that, you know, in other contexts, you know. Um, now, this is designed in, for the interior. If you want to do exterior work, then you use a drone that corrects its heading and bearings with, um, with GPS signals. So I wanted to talk about that just a little bit, that there are now options for doing really high quality interior work with drones. Let's see, Park Ranch, I think I've shown you that. I've shown you um, the geoglyphs um, from World War II context, uh, shown you buildings. Um, and I think this should excite your imagination. Yeah, there's lots of possibilities here. You know, there's lots of possibilities for you to do work with drones in archaeology. So what I'm going to do now is I want to start. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Ron Fields. Uh, Let's see, this is a comment. Denise Pearson says, NASA is going to fly a drone on Mars. Heck yeah, they're going to fly a drone on Mars. And I actually saw that drone that they're going to fly on Mars at the, uh, at the Albuquerque, uh, it was at the science, it was a the Explorer. They had a presentation on that drone and it's a helicopter drone with, uh, with big massive sweeping blades above and below the instrument package because they need to have a lot of lift because there's very little atmosphere on Mars. So they need big massive blades to push enough air to get lift. But yeah, it's gonna be sweet. Um, using, what kind, using point cloud, what kind of resolution can you get? What if I had rock walls and wanted to image each rock so that if a wall uh, were to partly collapse, I could restore the appropriate stones in their proper placement through stabilization? Good question, Ron, uh, as always. The resolution of the point cloud is the resolution, theoretically, of the image, the, the GSD, basically the sampling of the image you take. You can do a point cloud of an area that is three feet by three feet at millimeter resolution if you have the data. That is not a problem. And of course, we know what can happen when you have a point cloud of an important resource that you need to restore, like, let's say, oh, Notre Dame. You know, that had just, it had just been interior mapped using LIDAR and a point cloud was made. So they now know exactly how to put it back together as built, right? As built, not as planned, but as built rendering. So you could, in fact, go to those precious resources in your unit and take pictures that are at sub-centimeter level resolution but you have to take thousands of them. It would be a nice day of just taking thousands of photos, put them through PIX4D, and then you would have a really, really good, um, a really, really good 3D rendering of that resource. So if there was something was to happen, you could put it back the way it should have been. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's completely doable. And people have, you know, obviously, will have done this. I just don't have examples off the top of my head, but we could, we could figure something out. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes. I want to uh, put your hand up and ask some more questions if you don't like, or if you like. So anybody, oh, here we go, Steve. When flying a drone to 3D map a site, do you complete the whole crisscross pattern with the camera at an angle or a combination of straight down and angled passes? Uh, if you have enough time and you have enough batteries and it's not too big an area, it does help to do a nader, right? Up and down, looking straight down, just one pass, and then do a crisscross at like a from vertical 65 degrees from vertical or 35 degrees up from, from perpendicular, from the, you know, straight up and down. Then do a crisscross with that. So then you have the top's rendered quite nicely, obliquely, right? You know, nice and flat. And then you'll have the sides done. So that's three passes. So that's 3X data. And then, you know, remember, you know, like when you're doing this data work, it either has to be done on the cloud or you have to get a copy of Pix4D for desktop. 
And I can typically do about a thousand image project in about four hours, four to six hours with the rig I have here that I'm using to show this presentation. So it takes a long time. It takes a, a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of computing power to get that done. So you have to, you know, offset, you know, how much data do I collect? What's the ground sampling distance? And then do I have the ability to process all that data uh, quickly? So, you know, so that, that hopefully that's a good answer for that. Okay, it's 11.45 and I, we have a few more uh, questions, time for questions if you want, or else we can um, release the group. And I'd like to thank everyone for showing up. I will uh, take the logs from this, uh, from this present. Oh, we got another question. Here we go, here we go, before we go. You're welcome, Steve. Just wondering about other federal, federal agency permitting requirements. Are you typically required to apply for an ARPA permit to conduct UAV data acquisition? Ah, yes, ARPA and data acquisition. That is obviously going to be part of your, your data collection strategy. So for, for George uh, Prothrow, uh, Prothrow asked this, yes, I would 100% be upfront and tell them exactly what you're doing for your ARPA permit to conduct UAV data acquisition because you are in fact, you know, you're, the good thing about the UAV data acquisition is that you're not trampling all over everything, you know, like you're not going to put your footy prints all over the whole thing. So when you're above, right, when you're in the air, you just collect photons, you don't touch the thing. I think that's a really good solution for taking, uh, for doing data acquisition in areas that are um, difficult to get to or sensitive because you're just looking at it really, aren't you? And then of course, you know, that's why I'm not showing you archeological sites here. I don't want to get anyone um, upset about showing what might be a protected resource in the state of New Mexico. Does the BLM issue a special use permit that will be needed to flower BLM lands as in addition to the 107 licensing from the FAA? And the answer to that, Jeff Pangburn is no, they do not control the airspace. They are not specific, in that air map, right? You saw in air map that those are open lands. You may fly those um, all you want because there are no existing federal laws from the surface up to space controlling that airspace. If it changes, right, we could, um, we would know about that. The, the basically that special uh, flyer, that special notice to the depart from the Department of Interior said that the agencies themselves could this equipment, right? But private individuals do have that ability to do that. And we have been doing it in co We've been flying in cooperation with the BLM every, you know, like every month we do a project or two that's on BLM land. And we use that data to help them do their job because they can't do it themselves. All right. Will this recording be available for you? Yes. Uh, thanks, David Zimmerman. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I think we're good. I'd like to thank everybody for holding out, and I will um, I will send out the emails for the folks who will be getting their certificates. I will then you know you'll have another email for when we get the uh, video processed and ready for presentation, and you'll also get a PDF of the PowerPoint. Okay, so everybody, thank you so much, and we will. Uh, end of the recording. Thank you.